June is finishing with a flurry for Lincoln, Riley, and the Trojans. Welcome into the Voice of College Football and our Monday show, Trojans Live. Matt Zemix here for a 58th consecutive week, and Matt makes it all go for us each and every Monday, 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. But you can catch Matt each and every day at Trojans Wire. The latest addition for USC football, Ryan Pelham, the wide receiver, who is the second rated, rated player in the class thus far out of 13 hard commits. We will dig deep into Ryan Pelham and uh, the USC recruiting picture overall. And we'll take your comments and questions as always, folks. So hit the like button, get that out of the way, and then dive in, get yourself settled, and leave those comments and questions. Matt, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. You know, uh, it was a, a weekend free of commitments, but we got the week started off right on Monday with the Ryan Pelham announcement. And I think, uh, you know, lot, lots of details that we're going to dive into. But I think the starting point is that, you know, just because USC is heading off to the Big Ten uh, next year, like that doesn't mean that Oregon ceases to be uh, a significant, relevant recruiting foe and that USC still has to plant its flag in the West. You know, obviously you go to the Big Ten and you're going to be in Chicago, you're going to be in New Jersey, you're going to be in, you know, the DMV. When you go to play Maryland, you're going to be in all these other markets in the uh, central and eastern time zones. But that doesn't mean you still <laughs> don't need to recruit the West. Like you still need to win your share of battles there and you still need to fend off Dan Lanning. And it's a it's a reminder that, you know, there's value in and of itself, getting Ryan Pelham, getting another four star prospect, getting the top two rated receivers in the 2024 class from the state of California. USC has uh, both of those uh, in the fold. Um, it's not just the value that USC adds, but also you are depriving Dan Lanning. You are depriving Oregon uh, of a score. And like that's going to continue to be relevant even when USC leaves the Pac-12, goes to the Big Ten, you, like you don't want Oregon to become a superpower. You don't want Oregon to become a thorn in your side. Let's also keep in mind that with the 12 team playoff era starting in 2024, uh, concurrent with USC's move to the big 10, like USC and Oregon could be battling for at large playoff bids. Right. And so anything you can do to not only enhance yourself, but deprive Oregon, it, it's, it's a double meaning. There's double, uh, the value here. So like that, that to me is the lead item, not just you. I mean, like USC is going to have great receivers under Lincoln Riley. So getting another receiver, like I'm not going to say, whoa, this is transformational. This is seismic. Like, <laughs> you know, we don't need to go down that road, but you know, you're winning the battle against Oregon. You're winning the battle against uh, Dan Lanning, who, you know, won that Josh Connerly recruitment last year. USC has needed to turn the tide and, this is one step in that larger process of, you know, keeping Oregon at arm's length. And, you know, Oregon is seventh, USC now eighth in the 247 sports rankings. Other uh, sites have slightly different rankings, but we can say that, you know, Oregon and USC are on par. They're pretty much on the same level. And certainly from a USC perspective, and people at, in Eugene might disagree with this, tough luck, but... I would say, you know, if Lincoln Riley and Dan Lanning are pulling in the same caliber of recruit, advantage Riley. Like Lanning needs to be several notches better than Lincoln Riley to say he really has the better program and or the better situation. But if you, if USC and Oregon are pretty much on that same plane, which right now the ratings would indicate they are, then you know, like USC should expect to do better than Oregon, regardless of whether they're in the same conference or not. Just in terms of this West Coast battle for leverage, uh, you know, USC has to feel really good about where it stands relative to Oregon. Some numbers on Ryan Pelham back in his sophomore season, 42 catches for 721 and 10 touchdowns uh, at Long Beach. Uh, California this past uh, junior season, 52 receptions over a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns as posted on the screen there, 23 total touchdowns rushing and receiving during his high school football career. Matt, which brings me to uh, the narrative that you started on here. Uh, 
we can only conjecture now and even in the aftermath, as we go down the road two or three years, we'll only be able to uh, take the metrics and come to a judgment determination of how many recruits are going to be uh, swayed by the, the brand, the ever-growing sterling, shiny brand of the Big Ten versus, hey, I just want to stay on the West Coast and the pack conference is still a reputable conference, still a strong conference, still the power five and I'll stay home and I'll, and, and, but many you would think are going to be allured by, okay, this is where it's at. You know, I need to play in the big 10. We know the sec and the big 10 where it's, it's where it's at. And I want to play on the big stages in front of the, the big TV viewerships. You know, I think there's something to that. And we talked about this a little bit last week on our show. I, I We might not have, you know, done a full deep dive into it, but to kind of tackle this topic more squarely, more head on, I think there's definitely something to it. And, you know, no disrespect intended to Oregon or also Utah and Washington. Like they're all, those programs are all doing really well. I'm going to talk about Washington's uh, recruiting in a little bit, in as a matter of fact, but you know, Michigan and Ohio State, like, you know, no offense to Oregon, Utah, Washington, but Michigan and Ohio State, like they are in a class by themselves in terms of tradition, in terms of television visibility, like oh, Oregon and Washington, Utah could do whatever they want. They could be spectacular. And or Oregon was spectacular, in fact, for several years under Chip Kelly and Washington made the playoff under Chris Peterson and had a really fantastic three-year run, 2016 through 2018. Utah back-to-back -back Rose Bowls. But they're never going to be Michigan or Ohio State. And so the lure of being able to, you know, spend most of your time in Los Angeles. And, uh, of course, you know, Annie Hansen, the USC uh, director of recruiting, like she puts on a show with these official visits, with the golden hour, with, you know, being able to, give these recruits a taste of the LA beach life and, and the beach lifestyle. But then you get to play, you're going to be able to play Michigan and Ohio state and Wisconsin and Penn state. I mean, I don't think anyone can deny that that's a really big lure and it's really a value added situation for USC relative to the PAC 12. I'm sure that this is pulling in more recruits. Like one of the things we wrote about at Trojans wire earlier in the month of June, what is it? that's luring recruits across the country. Like you're seeing balanced regional geographical representation in this class, you know, Pelham from, from California, but still you have a lot of different recruits from all over the country. And particularly you have multiple recruits from both Georgia and Florida. You know, it's hard to think that if USC was still in the PAC 12 was going to remain in the PAC 12, that some of these guys we're going to give USC the same look, the same level of consideration that the Trojans are getting right now. And, you know, it, it, it was not unnoticed and it was not uh, unremarked upon that at that uh, official visit weekend a week ago, that USC players, these income, these 2024 recruits, there was a big 10 patch on, on their uniforms. Like <laughs> that's not a, that's not an accident. It's not a minor detail. Like, it's leaning into that brand uh, and I, it's definitely having an effect. Now we can debate the extent of the effect, but the, the big 10 factor is definitely there at USC. The fans notice it. They see it. People within the program, you know, you know that that's a recruiting tool. You know, you're going to go up against the very, very best. You're going to have a much bigger television platform than the PAC 12 network. Uh, ever gave you. you know, you're not going to be buried late at night nearly as often. You're going to be playing a lot more primetime games. You're going to be on big noon Saturday when you go on the road to the Eastern time zone. Like it's there. We can do the math. Two plus two equals four. That That's definitely in the background as a significant extra uh, lure for Lincoln Riley and his staff at USC. Hey, Matt, uh, two of the components, one of which you just touched upon, one of which you've touched upon in previous editions, uh, really come into focus with the other big commit that came in prior to Ryan Pelham, and that would be the offensive lineman Jason Zandamella. Number one, Clearwater, Florida. 
difficult to get players out of Florida. And if they're going to leave Florida, it's typically for the likes of Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, uh, LSU, but coming all the way across country. So the regionality that you just touched upon and then a narrative and a position group that you've hit upon in the past as being crucial to USC's next step of elevation would be offensive linemen, superior elite offensive linemen. And we're talking about uh, Jason um, Zandamella again as a second rated interior offensive lineman, a top 10 rated player in the state of Florida, a top 50 to 60 national recruit choosing USC at 6'3", 285. Absolutely. And, and we have to imagine if USC was, you know, staying in the PAC 12, would Zandamella have given USC the same uh, level of consideration? I mean, it's, it's really a, some, a fascinating thing to contemplate. Like we, we won't know the answers for sure, but it is impressive and it, and it is very conspicuous that USC is able to recruit at a position of need and, and get it from, uh, a part of the country where, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily expect it. And actually, USC has two Clearwater, Florida products. Jarvis Boatwright, the safety, also from, from Clearwater. And you also, you like, one thing that's worth mentioning here, Mark, and everyone watching here at the Voice of College Football, we're not even talking about transfers. Like, we're not, we haven't even included the transfers in the equation here. Bear Alexander from Georgia being part of the equation, you know, there, there really has been an, an ability in this offseason cycle in recruiting, also in the portal for Lincoln Riley to go into the deep South uh, and get guys to, to want to play for USC. And, you know, because the PAC 12 has been such a punching bag and a laughing stock, you know, working on a seven year playoff drought, we'll see if uh, USC can be the team to snap that playoff drought this year. But, like the Pac-12, I, I I think this move to the Big Ten, you know, there is the value and the attractiveness of going to the Big Ten. We also need to consider just USC's not in the Pac-12. Like that's that's another dimension of this. It's not that USC is in the Big Ten. It's that USC will be a not Pac-12 program and that that in and of itself, like if USC was in the ACC, might might be doing just as well as if it was the Big Ten. I mean, I know that sounds like a crazy hypothetical, but I'm just trying to make the point of escaping the Pac-12, escaping the PR hit uh, that you take from being in the Pac-12 and not having the nearly the same level of national visibility that you have in the other Power Five conferences. Just escaping the Pac-12 might be, might be uh, a reason that some recruits in other parts of the country uh, see USC as being more valuable. And, you know, we've seen uh, players from Connecticut, Colorado, uh, other parts of the country. Cur curiously enough, Mark, the Midwest is the, is the region of the country that doesn't have uh, a representative uh, on this recruiting class. Now, that, that's kind of fascinating. Uh, and, and, you know, make of that what you will. But, you know, you, you've, you've seen New England, you've seen the Rocky Mountains, the Mountain Time Zone, you know, various parts of the West, like USC's gone into Oregon for a tight end. Uh, and then you have Georgia and Florida, you know, really a really interesting mix. And of course, the, all, all of this is on top of in the 2023 class, Tackett Curtis uh, from Louisiana. So it's really it really is fascinating to see the geographical makeup and the geographical diversity of this 2024 uh, recruit, recruiting class at USC. And one has to wonder, you know, if USC was still bolted down uh, to the Pac-12, uh, would USC be getting this national reach into many different corners of the country uh, if it was still in, in, in its uh, current conference? We appreciate you all being here at the Voice of College Football. Good crowd on a Monday night, 11 Eastern and 8 Pacific, where it counts. Matt Zemick and I get together each and every Monday to talk USC football with all of you. Don't forget about Tim and Rick on Sunday night. That's at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific for Trojan Conquest Live. And again, we also have USC channel memberships and you get bonus cuts from Matt and myself. We've got seven 
in the books, on the books, and then uh, we will continue to present those each and every week. So that's one choice cut, as Matt would like to say, one choice cut per week from Matt and myself. And I really enjoy having the conversation. Matt and I do about a 15 to 30 minute segment and really uh, give it a good look in regards to not just your average everyday recruiting look or position battle look, but um, really some interesting narratives that uh, dissect USC football and it's moved to the big 10. It's, it's, it's a uh, place on the national landscape moving forward and historically good stuff there. We enjoy delivering it. We hope that you enjoy it. Uh, look at the tiers on the USC channel memberships and please uh, join us there. All right, everyone. It seems like uh, we've got a split audience between recruiting nuts that want to continue to talk recruiting and then others that say, you know what? It's 2023. Let's get to that. Uh, yes, we are just about 60 days away. So think about this. Hey, I believe it's exactly 60 that comes to mind. Today is June 26th. The days may not add up to 60 with 31 in one of the two months, but play along with me. Two months from today is August 26th, and that is USC's opener uh, on August 26th. San Jose State, correct? Yes, San Jose State. I don't know how good the Spartans are going to be. They they won a, um, a truncated season uh, Mountain West Conference Championship a couple years ago in 2020. Uh, but um, I, I think that's a blip on the radar as USC will prepare for tougher games, but still uh, people will be, uh, I enjoy the week zero. Typically what I enjoy about week zero, Matt, uh, and now in recent years, we've had more power five teams become involved um, as the networks have become more, uh, more pursuing uh, a marquee game to grab an audience. We had Nebraska and uh, Northwestern last year. We had Nebraska and Illinois on Fox the season before. But typically, that's my week to watch some teams that I will not watch the rest of the season. I've already looked at that ESPN primetime game. I believe it's UMass and New Mexico State. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch that game from start to finish knowing I will never watch either one of those teams play probably one play the rest of the year, but it's fun. Yeah. Unless, yeah, unless they might get dumped into like a Friday 6 PM game before like the main yeah. ESPN. Yeah. I'll watch the first quarter Friday. Yeah. Game. Uh, yeah it, only in, in those kind of situations or a bowl um, game. You know, I will watch all the bowl games. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Hey, for those who don't know, like I, I'm a card carrying member of the kickoff classic fan club. Uh, I, I, I wonder why that game stopped being played. Like that was just such a, a fun, obvious thing to do to start each season. You get two brand name teams, uh, you know, in the Meadowlands or somewhere else. Um, that was a heck of a lot of fun. And I, and I kind of wish it would, it would come back uh, to college football. And I think one of the things that I'd like to see more of in week zero in late August, I'd like to see more games, but uh, particularly have like a weekend of games, uh, ha, you know, like, you, you know, you have a Sunday games that are, you're going to have more games on Labor Day Sunday uh, this coming season. Like CBS is going to have, uh, a, 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 I think a big 10 uh, pack 12 double header on Labor Day Sunday. If I'm not mistaken, I think Rutgers, has a noon Eastern game on Labor Day Sunday. And then there's an Oregon State, uh, San Jose State game on Labor Day Sunday. Uh, so like that, that's a whole barrel of fun. So why not, if you're going to do it on Labor Day Sunday, why not do it for week zero as well? Why not have, you know, Saturday and Sunday college football in late August, you know, just fill that inventory, get give more platforms to, not just the big name teams, but also these other teams that, as you mentioned, Mark, they're not going to have that standalone uh, window, that standalone visibility for the rest of the season. I I'd say let's have more of this. The only thing is, because it is late August, play these games at night. Play these games uh, when there are shadows, you know, over the field and and they're not being made to play in a very hot, withering sun. 
So like for that Labor Day Sunday uh, double header I referred to, those are both day games. And I don't think you need to do that. But, you know, play more games at night and in the evening. Like you have a 6 p.m., 6.30 Eastern game uh, in an Eastern time zone location. And then you have a 10 p.m. Eastern game in a in a Western uh, location so that neither of those are day games. But I think there are ways to load up the week zero uh, schedule uh, with even more games. Um, but, you know, just to contemplate that, hey, it's two months until USC uh, starts its season. Uh, that's going to be great. And also a reminder that uh, Sunday or Saturday, September 2nd, you know, circle that on your calendars, not because Nevada is going to be this uh, nail biter going down to the wire, but because that's probably the last USC football game ever to be shown on Pac-12 Network and Tim Prangley and the folks at Trojan Conquest Live, they're going to be throwing a big bash uh, in celebration. So like USC is getting Pac-12 Network out of its life, out of its existence very early this season. And uh, that that's going to be fun. Now, here's another thing. Here's another thematic uh, tie-in or motif to, to bring up for these early games for USC, especially uh, San Jose State and Nevada. You know, we just saw over the weekend, we saw the Angels beat the Rockies 25 to 1. And that's how USC needs to treat San Jose State and Nevada. Like the, a Los Angeles team needs to put these games to bed very early so that Miller Moss and Malachi Nelson, not to mention various other defensive and offensive line backups, get significant playing time because we didn't really get to see that a whole lot in 2022. Like, the Colorado game for USC last year, yeah, it was a blowout, uh, USC winning by over 30. But if you recall, USC was asleep in the first 15, 20 minutes of that game. And so it, it was still close. And it, you know, USC still needed to then wake up in the second and third quarters. And so we didn't get Miller Moss until the fourth quarter. That was kind of a wasted opportunity. You know, USC really needs to go, you know, full Angels Rockies on these these uh, two cupcake opponents starting the season so that Miller Moss and Malachi Nelson between them they both get a quarter. They they can they can come in at halftime uh and really begin to accumulate reps. And I've said this before but it's worth repeating again now that we're getting a little bit closer to the start of the season and those two early games. That, you know, Nick Saban at Bama, Kirby Smart at Georgia, Dabo at Clemson. Like they use these cupcake games to give their backups significant playing time. And that's how you build a national championship program. You are able to you can't develop players just on the practice field. I mean, that's part of it. But giving these guys significant in-game reps, getting them really used to the experience of game day, get putting them in different situations. You can't do that if you're letting bad teams or just inferior teams hanging around late third, early fourth quarter so that, you know, the amount of garbage time is so small that Miller Moss, Malachi Nelson and others just get a few drives. You really need to put these games away by halftime so that your backups can get lots of playing time in second halves. And I can't stress enough how important that is. And let's keep in mind that, you know, Cliff Kingsbury, this is likely a one-year rental for Lincoln Riley on the USC staff. He's going to get a head coaching or coordinator job in the college ranks uh, next year in 2024. So, like, you need to give as many data points to Malachi Nelson, to Miller Moss, so that Cliff Kingsbury and Lincoln Riley, but, you know, Riley's trying to manage the whole show, and he's trying to make sure that the defense – doesn't squander this season for Caleb Williams. So Riley's going to going to be in a little bit more of a CEO mold and Kingsbury can do a little bit more hands-on coaching. You need to give as much information to Kingsbury in his teaching of Nelson and Moss this season. And that goes to the importance of these early season games, get them done as quickly as possible uh, so that your backups can really get that level of playing time and that level of game day familiarity which in 2024 with the move to the big 10 is going to pay dividends. So in USC is obviously playing this season 
on its own terms for the prizes it can win this year. But the other piece of the puzzle is that you're also playing these games to set the table for 2024 and future seasons so that your young pups and your underplayed players are going to be ready when the Big Ten comes calling. As we get a continued look at the Week Zero slate, yes, if I'm an athletic director at a school that doesn't get much exposure, I am like first in line throwing my hand up saying, we will play on Week Zero wherever you want us. We will play on Week Zero. We just want to get on an ESPN, a Fox, a CBS. That's where we want to be. I also think that this would be hilarious. It's not going to happen, but we notice the primetime ESPN game on week zero is UMass and New Mexico State. If I'm ESPN, and I'm somewhat joking, I would tap Fowler and Herb Street on the shoulder and say, hey, let's have some fun. We're going to drag you guys out to do this game. Come on, let's do this game. A little bit of a warm-up. There you go. Do the UMass, New Mexico State in primetime on ESPN. Kind of like when they, they break out to do the – uh, Las Vegas Bowl before they really have to kick in with the Rose Bowl and the playoff games. They'll give them a like a Las Vegas Bowl or or one of those bowl games just to get them keep them warmed up and and ready to roll. Let's let's remember now, Mark. You've touched on you've kind of inspired the, this recollection for the older people in the crowd, people who are at least like 45, 50 years old, and so who are old enough to remember watching football on television in the early 1980s let's remember in 1982 during the nfl strike all right with the when the nfl was on strike uh cbs had to fill inventory and it had pat summerall and john madden calling either a division two or division three i think it was division three not sure but it was d either d2 or d3 this is available on youtube folks so sending Summerall and Madden to a tiny little stadium just in the middle of the woods, you know, in Love the middle that. of nowhere, calling a game on CBS in 1982. That That is a thing that actually happened. So you need, you know, we're in the middle of summer. It's the perfect time to go down a Summerall Madden small college football rabbit hole. It goes exactly to your point about, yes, yeah, send Fowler and Herbie to Las Cruces for some hatch green chili burgers and a little small town hospitality against UMass. Why not? Why that the hell not? That would be so much fun. Love that it kind of be. stuff. It would be. Love it would that be. kind of stuff. It would be. And our, it reminds our, us that game day should be doing more broadcasts from those kinds of locations throughout the year. For sure. Uh, they can only show up in Columbus and Tuscaloosa so many times. Uh, our, our buddy Gixer Squid shows up with this one. Uh, Matt, with all the NFL tank for CW talk, how does this factor into recruiting for USC? I would take his call and insight to heart. Hard not to see USC's value right now as a recruit. Uh, Gixer, another excellent question. I think that, you know, the, uh, the recruitment, uh, for Caleb, I think a lot of that happens on in the transfer portal. You know, you know, guys who want who have wanted to play with Caleb Williams, like Dorian Singer. I mean, right? Dorian Singer looked at Caleb Williams in that USC Arizona game last October and said, "You know, I'd like to catch passes from that guy." Not that Jaden Delora is bad, but he is volatile. Um, and like, you know, I have a chance to make something special happen with Caleb Williams. So that portal recruiting, like, you know, and Jordan Addison was a Caleb Williams portal recruit. Like they both have roots in the, in the DMV. Um, it, so in, in many ways, the portal Gixer is where that really had a, an immediate impact more than, than, uh, on the recruiting trail. But with Caleb Williams, you know, being a Heisman winner and having such a high profile and being such the, a clear, favorite for number one overall pick in next year's draft the 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 significance of of that Gixer is that USC has very quickly under Lincoln Riley rebranded itself as quarterback you you know that the university which used to be famous for student body right uh in another era it's now quarterback university like if you want to be taught how to play quarterback at the highest level 
Caleb Williams is really cementing that brand. Now, you know, people will wonder, well, what happened with Dylan Rayola? What happened with Elijah Brown? Well, but I mean, they're looking at Malachi Nelson and they're, and they're saying and they're seeing that, oh, OK, that that position's accounted for. Um, so like in terms of Caleb Williams fact, uh, impact on recruiting, like I don't think that he's uh, getting in the way of anything. Uh, I think that, you know, you, what USC does in terms of its 2025 and especially 2026 recruits at quarterback, which, you know, we're not going to know for a few years, uh, but that will add to Caleb Williams effect on USC recruiting. But in terms of the near term, in terms of the short term, Caleb Williams uh, brand identity profile, they've all had a huge impact on uh, the transfer portal and USC being able to just get these skill position players and not just receivers either, you know, Marshawn Lloyd, that's a high end piece. Um, the, the other, you know, offensive lineman as well, Jarrett Kingston, you know, being a good example, you know, guys in guys in the pac 12 who have had a front row seat for Caleb Williams. And, Oh, I want to play with that guy. Uh, that's really where Caleb Williams uh, impact in terms of bringing players into USC has been most paramount. There was a question in the chat. I've lost track of it, but it was basically uh, in regards to any news or any rumors on the front of uh, the USC pursuit of a new athletic director. Haven't heard anything about that. And I would only say that our, you know, our uh, administrative expert, uh, among other things, Tony Altimore, you know, really good at no knowing how things work behind the scenes. He told us, uh, here at the Voice of College Football, that you know this is not going to be an instant thing. It's not going to be a quick uh, process with Sandy Barber, former AD at Cal and Penn State, on Carol Fultz' uh, transition team, and also former uh, Big Twelve Commissioner uh, uh, Kevin Weiberg, uh, also being on that team. Like these are some big hitters, and so they're not going to make a a quick decision. You don't bring in those kinds of big hitters. Uh, to, to do something quickly. You're going to study, you're going to evaluate. It's going to take uh, a considerable amount of time. So there doesn't seem to be any rush. And let's step back for a moment, uh, you know, uh, on that topic of USC's athletic director, it's not hurting recruiting. <laughs> like this is not getting in the way of USC and Lincoln Riley's ability to recruit. No one's saying, Oh, they haven't filled Mike Bone's spot. Uh, that, that's going to give me a second thought about all this. Like, we're that's not happening. So that that is pretty notable that the the good ship USC is sailing along uh, in terms of piling on the recruits, getting the the high rankings. Uh, USC's had per Chris Trevino, the excellent uh, two four seven sports uh, USC analyst. He's noted that USC has eight four star players recruited in the month of June. Well, that, that is quite a haul. So definitely the athletic director is not getting in the way, uh, not having a negative effect uh, on USC football recruiting. We would like to highlight and also recognize uh, our YouTube members here at the Voice of College Football USC. Thank you so much to Scooby's Tube and Gixer Squid, LBC Robbie and Jason, Bernardino Vega, We've got uh, ACBMJB1, William, Hal, also all of you. Thank you so much for being members here at the Voice of College Football USC and for your memberships, of course, on the second and third tiers. You get uh, the choice cut from Matt and myself each and every week. We've got seven uh, on deck for all of you that are already uh, available and we will continue to record those each and every week. I just want to step in here for Gixer and the other members who are watching this broadcast. We, we'd love some feedback on these uh, bonus segments. Like if, if one really hit the mark or if one, you know, didn't quite hit it, we'd like to know because we want to know that people are watching these segments and that you're getting value uh, for your USC membership here at the Voice of College Football. So feel free to send along the feedback and, you know, criticisms welcome. Like we're big boys. This like, that's what helps us grow. Um, whatever your feedback is, we'd love to have it about these bonus segments uh, that Mark and I do, and that we're continuing to accumulate here at the voice of college football. Thank you. Gerardo. 
listening and watching you guys from Columbia, South America tonight. A pleasure. Worth every minute. Thank you. Gerardo, Gerardo, Gerardo you so you're one of our best uh, viewers and followers. Really appreciate your insights and, and your constant feedback and interest. We really appreciate it. Now, of course, with all that USC can achieve in 2023, let's not discard this season already. We're only <laughs> we're we have yet to play a game, and I know people are excited about 2024. Uh, we we typically get more questions about 2024 with everything going on and everything happening, uh, but we'll take one of those because uh, it sparks some conversation in the chat about the Malachi Nelson versus Miller Moss debate for the QB one spot for 2024, Matt. Yeah, it's a it's a certainly a fascinating sports bar type of question, an irresistible question to to wrestle with, to grapple with, and so like right now, of course, Miller Moss is is more advanced than Malachi Nelson, but then we need to see how the season unfolds, and we need to see how much of an opportunity both guys get, and that goes back to the point of USC needing to put the hammer down in those cupcake games so that both quarterbacks get a significant opportunity to learn and grow with Cliff Kingsbury teaching them i think the really interesting question i mean not that you know who's going to start game one next year isn't an interesting question it's a hugely interesting question but i think the, the the more central item is deep down if you ask lincoln riley which one does he want to be the starter uh in week one next year like that that and you know we, he's not gonna say but i think that's really an interesting question because like if if Lincoln Riley thinks everything is going according to plan. Does that mean that one of the two uh, has the clear upper hand at the end of the 2023 season? Would Lincoln Riley just welcome an open battle in which both guys are performing relatively well? You know, does he have a favorite? Does he have a preference? Or is it just about competition and letting the process happen? We don't know. But to me, that's the really interesting question. And of course, uh, like Lincoln Riley didn't just say to Cliff Kingsbury, Oh man, you have some spare time. Are you free? You know, you know, you just help me out a little bit here. I mean, no, th there was certainly a discussion of, Hey, like I have Caleb Williams here. I'm going to be coaching it up as we pursue a national championship or at least a college football playoff berth in 2023. But Cliff, I need you to teach these guys you know, in a granular way at a level I'm not able to do since I have to oversee the, the whole football program. I need you to really coach up these guys for me and, and help me out in 2023 so that in 2024, they're much more polished. They're much more uh, ready to, to contribute, to play right away. That like the speed of the game is not going to intimidate them. They're going to be ready to rock and roll. So does Lincoln Riley really in his heart of hearts prefer one or the other, or is he truly, um, you know, neutral uh, on that question? Again, I don't know the answer. I don't claim to know the answer, but to me, that is the, the even more intriguing question surrounding the 2024 quarterback spot at USC. Folks, your questions and comments stand out with a, a super chat contribution as well. Just consider that, uh, what Matt, basically what you're speaking to there is we all know that coaches are enamored with high-end talent. They just think about the possibilities of what that could be, even if it's inconsistent, even if there's a lot of flaws involved, if it's rough. Uh, because what you are speaking to, especially at the quarterback position, it's that's the easy one uh, to, to discuss and to evaluate, is this happens frequently where you'll have one quarterback who is making all the right reads, making all the right decisions, who's a better student of the game, possibly has a better work ethic, doing all the right things, doesn't quite have the arm talent, doesn't have that dynamic playmaking ability, et cetera. But this other guy over here, and to your original point, it's if you could get to the heart of hearts, who would that particular coach, Lincoln Riley in this case, really want to win the job? You'll hear that comment made a lot. Who do they really want to win the job? And you kind of think, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that they see the potential of what that player could be at his best versus this other player who's a nice player and probably is doing checking more of the boxes from a tangible standpoint right now, but they really want to see what the potential of this player over here could be. 
uh, if they hit their ceiling. No question. Like, has Lincoln Riley fallen in love with Malachi Nelson in a foot in a football sense? You know that like that's the kind of thing that you know that question is trying to get at. And we again, we don't know, but it's really going to be interesting. And like one, so one thing to look at for that August week zero season opener against uh, San Jose State. If, if, if all of you, you know, are really want to dive into elements of the 2023 season, a natural starting point is going to be, you know, who gets the third quarter, who gets the fourth quarter. And, you know, if, if USC is able to put that game to bed, like at halftime or right after halftime, how are the snaps going to be divvied up? How are the drives, the possessions going to be uh, divvied up? Like that might give us the first, a uh, little clue, but then there's also another piece to all of this, and that is that USC's schedule, and you know, said it before, but it, it bears repeating. USC's schedule doesn't really get tough or challenging until the Notre Dame game uh, on October 14th. So the way in which Riley Kingsbury and and the offensive staff dole out snaps, reps. Uh, you know, in-game reps uh, to uh, uh, Miller Moss and, and Malachi Nelson in week zero and week one against Nevada could be very different uh, in, uh, you know, week five, week six, playing Colorado, playing Arizona uh, and, and those situations. And so week one is going to be interesting, you know, in terms of, you know, where things stand at that point in time. And it's going to be the return to game day, the return to on field action that will that will be our first look but where are things going to stand at the end of September and early October that that will give us a sense of how the progression uh has evolved that will give us a sense of you know which guys have grown more from week 0 to week 6 and that might give us the fuller indication of where things are going to be at the end of 2023 and let's just keep in mind that because the schedule is backloaded, where the Moss Nelson battle uh, is situated, what the state of play is in that particular position battle in week six, that might be the ultimate indicator of where things are because Moss and Nelson are not likely to see the field very much from mid October onward. Like the one game uh, from October 14th or later in which both of those guys, Moss and Nelson, you know, might get uh, uh, some some meaningful snaps is the Cal game uh, on October 28th, the game that's sandwiched in between the Utah game on uh, October 21st and then the Washington game uh, on November 4th. So, th like, the USC staff, Riley and Kingsbury, they're not going to get too many looks at Moss and Nelson, most likely in the second half of the season. It's going to have to come in that first half – and so, therefore, where where the state of play is uh, in week six, you know, in early October, before the trip to South Bend in mid October, you know, that could be, uh, you know, the, a, a, a more defining verdict. I'm not going to say will be; it could be. It's definitely going to be more of a, an indicator than where the state of play is in, in week zero and week one. That's for sure. Question coming in here as well: How will these? How will this offense look uh, without uh, Jordan Addison with the loss of such a high profile wide receiver that drew a lot of attention from the defense? I, you know, I think with Dorian Singer coming in to replace Jordan Addison and with the other receivers that are still around, you know, Mario Williams is still there. I don't think that's, that's a huge concern. And I really think that, you know, with USC, like I try to be critical you know, I try and call a spade a spade that if there's this weakness, if there's this flaw, if there's this limitation, like I'm going to make note of it. All right. But with the USC offense <laughs> in 2023, I'm having a hard time finding anything to really criticize or go, whoa, you know, that's an area of concern. Like I'm just not finding it. I mean, maybe, maybe tight end, maybe <laughs> with USC's recruited well. Uh, at that position. And, and even, you know, if you don't have an elite talent at tight end, we still saw Lincoln Riley incorporate the tight end into, into the offense and get some big plays against Utah and Notre Dame with that. So really 
like I, I'm just not seeing any really significant flaw in the offense. Like I think the offensive line depth is the natural point of concern because you saw what happened without Andrew Voorhees uh, against Utah in the Pac-12 championship game. You saw how much that mattered, but USC by all appearances uh, seems to have better offensive line depth. You know, it seems to be more fortified too deep at each of the five main uh, offensive line positions. You know, Justin Dietrich coming back for this year, huge, enormous, just so much continuity uh, and leadership uh, c- comes back to USC through his return and being able to retain him for one more season. And then you add all the portal additions and then guys coming up within the program who are going to be more seasoned. Like it's a, it's a more complete offensive line room. And so whether it's wide receiver or running back and running back is where USC is a lot deeper than it was last season when it was basically just Travis die in the nine, 10 games before he got injured. Uh, in November, USC's deeper at running back. Um, it, it, like I'm really having a hard time finding a flaw. Like the only real thing is what applied last year, and that is if Caleb Williams gets injured. You know, the unthinkable, the the one thing that USC cannot afford at all. I mean that that's there, but like I really, other than that, I'm I'm just having a very hard time finding a significant flaw. Slight flaw, you know. Again, okay, tight end. Um, maybe a little bit of offensive line uh, depth here and there, but uh, there's no big fatal flaw with this offense. It's it's so much about the defense, also about making sure that special teams and the lack of a coordinator don't bite this team in the butt uh, in a big moment. Uh, it's so much about defense and 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 a little bit on special teams. This offense, like you know. I'm not going to say it has a flaw just for the sake of trying to find one, right? If there really isn't a significant flaw on a whole side of the ball, I'm going to say that. And so there isn't really a significant flaw on this offense. It's really going to be what Alex Grinch does on the defensive side of the ball. Our buddy Lemansky stopping by. Lemansky, thank you so much for your contribution. With the depth of offensive coaching – at quarterback specifically, the arms race in 2024 between USC and the Ohio State could add up as a big benefit to the Big Ten. Could be a pushback versus the SEC arrogance slash dominance. Well, Lemansky, I would certainly say that you know the way C.J. Stroud played against Georgia in the Peach Bowl, like that, that does reinforce your point that if you have. A, an, an ultra talented quarterback playing his best. And that was, that was by far CJ Stroud's best game as a Buckeye. Like, you know, he was good in, in his uh, multiple seasons at Ohio state, but he was spectacular in that game against Georgia. He really did elevate his game to another level. So if you get that kind of quarterback performance uh, against a Kirby smart defense against the Nick Saban defense, I mean, that, that is going to give, uh, the Big Ten uh, a chance, and yet, and yet, it still wasn't enough for Ohio State because the the Buckeyes, uh, you know, were were so creaky and, and frail on defense. You know, despite the arrival of Jim Knowles uh, as defensive coordinator, he he generally does need more time at his coaching stops uh, to figure things out. But assuming that Knowles can get Ohio State's defense back to a reasonable place and uh, you know, maybe there's more of a chance there. I, I do have to say that, you know, the way Michigan's defense was not able to, to handle TCU uh, in the Fiesta Bowl, like, you know, you, you can have your offense, you can have your quarterbacks, but, you know, as USC, as well as Ohio State and Michigan, like they all had the same problem. They, they all suffered their most crushing losses of 2022 because the defense just gave way. You know, none of those three defenses were championship level. And so as great as the quarterbacking is, Lemansky, uh, in the Big Ten, as great as it, as it is likely to be or as great as it could be, you need to have defenses which can stand in the ring, take a few punches, and none of, none of the three, Ohio State, Michigan, USC, were fully up to the challenge last year. That's going to have to improve uh, by a noticeable degree. 
to extend on Lemansky's point in another direction, but taking the same two programs, these are the two programs that have proven over time that in the new Big Ten, they are the two that have won on the national landscape. So Michigan, for as big as Michigan is, and for as great as they are currently in the Big Ten and have defeated Ohio State head-to-head, it's been forever since Michigan won landmark games nationally. Of course, Pete Carroll's Trojans were a nationally relevant program and in the mix for a national championship year after year after year after year. Ohio State has broken through a number of times. And when you talk nationally, you're basically talking about the SEC. And Ohio State's been the one program in the Big Ten that has been able to play on an SEC level and lose some, win some, but play, you know, on that level with elite athletes recruiting at that level. And that's where it starts the recruiting for as good as Michigan's been. They don't recruit at that level. They are currently ranked at that level, but if you dig a little bit deeper, I don't know that they are. I think it's more about player ranking and uh, Ohio state's still far ahead of them. And it's a USC Ohio state dynamic. I think uh, historically and until proven otherwise currently, this brings up uh, a point about recruiting. It gives us a chance to go back to recruiting and a, and a few details that Mark was getting at, that Ohio State is number two in the 247 sports uh, recruiting rankings for 2024, and that's with 16 commits. USC's eighth with 13, but four of the seven programs that are ahead of USC in the 247 uh, 2024 rankings list, they have at least 20 commits. So USC has a lot fewer uh, commits and yet is eighth. And so if we project, you know, if USC gets to uh, 20 with the caliber of recruit that USC is getting on average, and Ohio State's pretty much in the same ballpark as USC in terms of the quality of each individual uh, recruit, uh, USC is poised to make some some significant gains. So there, Mark, Mark put it up on the screen so Michigan at 23, like that's that's almost double uh, what USC has. Uh, so Michigan's ranking, which is obviously impressive, it's nothing to sneeze at, but it's on the basis of getting nearly twice as many players uh, as USC, whereas Ohio State with seven fewer commits is still slightly ahead uh, of Michigan. And so, you know, Penn State has uh, 20 commits. Notre Dame has 21 USC only 13 so it shows that there's more upside there's more room to grow for USC and it also shows that USC like Ohio State also like Florida with just 17 commits but clocking in there at uh, number four um, those programs are getting more bang for the buck so to speak they're getting more quality for each uh, individual recruit with Michigan it's been a little bit more saturation somewhat akin to what Deion Sanders has done at Colorado uh, in the transfer portal, that Colorado had a top two transfer portal class, not so much because of the individual quality of each player, but because of volume. Uh, And and so it's going to be interesting to see how these dynamics shake out. It's also notable that even though USC is top eight in the country uh, in 2024 for the recruiting rankings, which, you know, is not bad. It's nothing to sneeze at, but, USC is still fourth in the Big Ten. <laughs> you have Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State all ahead of the Trojans. Now, again, USC hopes to change that math, to change that equation uh, in the course of time. But it still shows that the Big Ten uh, is really uh, enjoying a, a superb 2024 recruiting cycle. Like, you don't have Alabama uh, in that top group. Um, you don't, you know, like the, the, the SEC is not the conference that's, uh, most represented in that top eight. It is mostly a big 10, uh, top eight, you know, with LSU there at number nine, Tennessee's, uh, a little bit further down in the, in the top 15. Uh, and of course, Stanford with Troy Taylor, uh, making a real splash, uh, in his first go round, like that's been a real surprise. So like who would have imagined that, Oregon, USC, and Stanford, you know, three West Coast programs would be ahead of Tennessee, Clemson, uh, Alabama, and and others. Like, no one would have predicted that uh, 12 months ago, six months ago. 
Uh, so really a lot of fascinating uh, dynamics in terms of uh, national recruiting. And the other story we just need to hit on very briefly, not connected to this list, but Washington pulled in five recruits on Monday uh, under Kalen DeBoer. And uh, a lot of people across the country have been wondering, well, what the heck's going on with Washington recruiting? It's been pretty silent, you know, barely any guys coming in. Well, so a five player haul, on Monday, that 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 is calming a lot of nerves on Montlake. Uh, people were wondering how that uh, recruiting drama was going to unfold in Seattle. It, it's it's a lot uh, more stable uh, today after the five player haul by Washington. So, to extend on Matt's point here, forget the number on the far left, the current ranking. Go to the number on the far right. Georgia average player rating is 93.1. Ohio State's is even better than that, slightly at 93.3. Michigan has nine three stars. So it's a really good class. We're not discounting or criticizing any of these classes. These are the best classes in the country currently. But with 23 commits, they have seven more three stars than Ohio State and no five stars. Uh, so they're at 90 and a half. And then as you go down here, keep in mind that Georgia, Ohio State at 93 plus. You're not going to see this. USC, though, pretty strong. 92.4. That's the third highest number we've seen uh, with 10 four stars and only three three stars. And then as we keep going, you're not seeing anything else above 92. Now we're going to see Alabama pop up here. You know, they're going to make a ridiculous surge here at some point. There they are. They've only signed eight players, and three of them are five stars. They're at a 94.3. They're actually number one in player rating. So do the math. Forget the ranking right now because they're all going to land uh, somewhere between 22 and 25 commits in that range. So think about it this way. If you're Michigan and you've got 23 commits right now or whatever the number is, they're not going to get too many more commits. Whereas USC with 12 or 13 still has another 10 to go. And if they're, they continue to uh, j just, just if you do the math, if you understand the math, you don't have to do it. That to, if, if you're USC and you're sitting there at 92.4 and you're Michigan at 90.3, that's a fairly large lead in terms of player ranking. So the more USC continues to just sign their caliber of player, then that ranking is going to rise and they're going to catch somebody like Michigan. Yep. That, so that's part of the recruiting context. And, and Hey, I'm no, I'm not a recruiting wizard, but I can do that basic math about, you know, number of commits, no, level of player ranking and, and wh which teams have, you know, kind of Mac, if not necessarily maxed out, but like they don't have too much more to add. And as Mark said, like Alabama with only eight commits, USC with 13, there's just simply naturally much more room to grow for those programs. So that's going to be a story to keep monitoring as this 2024 recruiting cycle runs its course. Georgia and Alabama are going to have two of the top five classes in the country. Georgia's probably going to have the number one class. Ohio State's going to have a top three or four class in the country. USC is going to be knocking on the door of the top five as well. You can almost take that to the bank. Seems pretty likely. All right, folks. Appreciate you all being here. The voice of college football. We've got just a tick under 200 on the line. So thanks everyone for being here. Keep this in mind that we're here every Monday at eight o'clock Eastern or Pacific time where it counts eight o'clock Pacific time. Would love for you to be here at that point. Bring a, a friend or two or 50 with you. And also, you can catch what you missed. It's posted all week. It's there and available for you. We love to have you here for the live show to interact with, with us. But again, uh, the, the video is posted all week. So definitely catch what you missed uh, here on Trojans Live. Uh, Matt, what's going on at uh, Trojans Wire? We well, you know there was a really uh, interesting story today, and that uh, is that Lincoln Riley is visiting the Iowa Hawkeyes. But that's uh, Eastern Illinois baseball transfer, Lincoln Riley. 
and uh you know so you know sports are meant to be fun folks so you know don't 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 say that you know oh you wrote you caused my blood pressure to, to rise you know sports are meant to be fun so we just had a little bit of fun with that lincoln riley transfer story uh on monday and i remind all of you that earlier this year caleb williams committed to tennessee that's linebacker caleb williams from nashville committing to the tennessee volunteers in January. So it is a point of fact that Caleb Williams has committed to Tennessee and Lincoln Riley has visited Iowa in 2023, having a little bit of fun here at Trojan's Wire. So, you know, in terms of what we're doing, I mean, we're, we're covering recruiting, like we're waiting to see if you, there's going to be another uh, USC gold rush, another uh, avalanche of emojis uh, tweeted out by Lincoln Riley. We're going to stay on that. We're also, you know, we're coming up on June 30th. So, San Diego State gate, you know, is this going to be uh, a situation where San Diego State gets out of the Mountain West by June 30, uh, you know, reduces its exit fee? Is there going to be a Pac-12 uh, realignment story uh, breaking on 4th of July weekend? Let's remember June 30, it's going to be the first year anniversary, first anniversary of the USC-UCLA move uh, to the Big Ten in terms of the announcement. So what, what will June 30 and July 1st bring? If there's any breaking stories, we're going to be on top of that. And then, of course, in the not-too-distant future, you know, July 21st, just so you circle that on your calendar, that's going to be Pac-12 Media Day with George Klyavkov. And there's every expectation within the Pac-12 that they're going to have the media rights deal done by then, and that they should have a realignment decision, an expansion decision by then. Um, the real question is whether it's going to happen by June 30 or July 1st. That's really going to be a story worth watching uh, this week. Uh, the only other thing I'd add about our coverage at Trojans Wire, we're going to do more Big Ten fun in July because, you know, we just kind of got to get this out of our system. And then in August, like it's going to be all 2023 um, and the focus on the season. But like July is our last off season month and a chance to explore Big Ten history, which we've been doing a lot, and I've had a lot of fun personally researching USC and Nebraska football history and kind of the interwoven plot points, commonalities, uh, shared uh, characteristics. Some of the obvious things is that they both had great coaching transitions. Nebraska with Bob Devaney handing off to Tom Osborne and USC pretty much at the same time with John McKay handing off to John Robinson, that's how dynasties stay intact, is that they're able to engineer uh, a great transition. So that's just one of the things that I've enjoyed researching about USC and Nebraska. But uh, when we get to 4th of July weekend, I'm going to un uncork the big uh, long-term connection between USC and Nebraska football. And, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy that. It's cer certainly, if any of you appreciate college football history, uh, you're going to like what's coming up at Trojans Wire in the month of July. Big Ten fans have ranked uh, the top 10 quarterbacks in the league, top 10 running backs, uh, top 10 uh, wide receivers coming out uh, tomorrow. So check that out over in the main channel. Matt and I are off to cut another segment, another choice cut from Matt and myself. And so please sign up on the front page of the USC channel right here. Top two tiers provide uh, the bonus segment. So for our eight members, we appreciate you. And uh, we would love to see that double and triple and go on beyond that. So again, check out the memberships and we would love to see you there. Uh, Matt, appreciate you doing this as always. Uh, make it on back everyone next Monday for Trojans Live. It's Trojan Conquest Live on Sunday night at five Pacific. We're back here next Monday at eight Pacific. And we'll see you then for all that you missed. Just wait, and you can watch the rest of the video as it posts here in just a couple seconds on Trojans Live. Thanks, everybody.